Hello, everyone. Welcome back to SALT Talks. My name is John Darcy. I'm the Managing Director of SALT, which is a global thought leadership forum and networking platform at the intersection of finance, technology, and geopolitics. What we've been trying to do with these SALT Talks is provide our audience a window into the minds of subject matter experts uh, who are among the world's leading investors, creators, and thinkers. We're trying to replicate that experience that we provided our in-person SALT conferences, which unfortunately uh, we were not able to do this year as a result of the pandemic. But we're really excited today to welcome Josh Harris uh, to SALT Talks. Uh, Josh is the co-founder of Apollo Global Management, one of the world's largest alternative investment firms. He's also the founder and managing general partner of Harris Blitzer Sports and Entertainment, an investment <clears throat> company that's focused on sports, entertainment, and media. Within the vast HBSC portfolio, Josh is the managing partner of the Philadelphia 76ers uh, in the NBA and of the New Jersey Devils in the NHL, as well as the general partner of Crystal Palace Football Club in the English Premier League. Uh, in addition to all of that, he's a great philanthropist. He serves as the founder and the chairman of the Harris Family Charitable Foundation, which strives to improve lives and strengthen communities through the transformative power of sport, precision wellness, preventative medicine, and leadership development. Uh, Josh earned his MBA from Harvard Business School, where he was named a Baker Loeb Scholar, and a BS in economics from the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School of Business, where he graduated summa cum laude. He and his wife reside in New York City with their five children. And hosting today's interview, as most of you know, is Anthony Scaramucci, who's the founder and managing partner of Skybridge Capital, which is a leading global alternative investment firm. And I'll turn it over to Anthony for the interview. I just want to thank everybody for wearing a blue shirt pursuant to my memo that went out last night. You guys at least paid good attention to all that, so thank you. Uh, Josh, I always start these interviews out with a seminal question because I know you, many people know you from the media because of your sports ownership, but not your background, how you got started, where you grew up, and I love asking that question. So can you tell us a little bit about that? And, uh, and, you know, uh, take us back to prior to your arrival in college and business school. Great. Thanks, Anthony. And it's awesome to be here. Thank you for having me. I grew up in Chevy Chase, Maryland. Uh, my dad, my, my path to uh, finance and Apollo and sports was uh, non-traditional. Um, my, my, I grew up with uh, my dad, who was an orthodontist. Uh, my mom and my dad and my family had grown up in Philly. My mom was a teacher in Philly, went to Temple University. My dad went to Penn, so I decided to go to Penn. Um, I had never heard of Warden when I joined Penn, but ultimately loved economics and um, was uh, and, and, jo and joined the Warden School after freshman year and then ultimately um, worked at uh, Drexel Burnham Lambert, where I met Leon Black and Mark Rowan. And in 1988, um, I went, I applied to one school, I applied to Harvard Business School, I said, if I get in, I'll take a break. And I got in, and then in 1990, um, during the, one of the great uh, financial crises that, that have kind of come about in my lifetime, and there have been five, um, <clears throat> uh, Drexel, uh, you know, went under, and Leon and Mark were starting Apollo, and they called me and said, can you join us after you get out of school? And I did. And I did. So that was my path. Um, I was a, a high school uh, and college wrestler. Um, I enjoyed, always enjoyed sports. And, um, you know, kind of it's led me to, you know, be involved with sports going forward. So that's, that was my path. So you talk about the crisis. You and I are uh... – we're getting old, Josh, okay? I mean, you know, we we've, had, we've had five or six crises. I'm going to take you back to, yeah, but that's Botox and hair dye. I can, I can introduce <laughs> you to my dermatologist if you need help. But, but let's go back to 1990. It's February of 1990. This legendary investment bank, the greatest, arguably one of the greatest innovators in the modern capitalist era, the introduction of junk bonds and all of the reengineering that took place in corporate America as a result of Michael Milken's brilliant innovation, it has been shut down. And we don't have to go into why it was shut down, but I want to ask you this question from your point of view back then. You had worked there, you went to school, it's now been shut down. And this is really for our younger viewers out there because what happens to all of us, it's happened to you, it's happened to me, we're planning things and God or the universe is laughing and things start to go in a different direction than we expect. And so 
Tell me what you were thinking at that moment and tell me some of the decisions you were making uh, to lead you to where you are today. Yes, yeah, so as a young man, I, um, you know, I was driven to be involved with finance and getting, um, you know, helping companies grow and, you know, raising capital and, you know, coming out of college, um, you know, at that point, Drexel was doing, uh, I felt that the best and the brightest people were there and they were doing a lot of attractive deals. So I joined um, and, and then um, I was, um, you know, I met great people there. And so in 1990, when uh, the economy collapsed, um, um, I saw an opportunity to take what I thought was, a, I always thought about my, and I always advise young people to think about their careers as an investment, like what's the risk and what's the return. And I felt that, um, that I was with great people who I knew the, you know, the way, uh, private equity or alternatives works is, you know, once you raise the capital, um, you know, you're in business, there's enough of a, a fee stream there that you can pay the bills. And so I knew I wasn't going to, um, go, go broke or not be able to, um, you know, kind of buy, a, you know, have an apartment or feed myself. And so I took the risk um, and joined up. And then, you know, Paul's always been about innovation and agility in uh, volatile financial uh, markets. And so we were, you know, we innovated and we, um, we well, everyone else had been doing bots the traditional way, which was, uh, you know, making equity investments and then borrowing from banks. There was no capital available to do that. So we went into the market and we bought um, <clears throat> debt of very big companies with very bad balance sheets. And we, uh, we created private equity transactions the opposite way. We deleveraged the companies, but we were able to both save many quality businesses as well as create great investment returns. And so Paul was born. And so um, like what, what drove me was really the ability to be around great people, the ability to learn. Uh, and the ability to, I thought, you know, to, I think, to innovate and be part of what I saw was a, uh, a new innovation in the financial markets, which would, uh, you know, was a win-win where, you know, we helped our investors, but we also helped the companies. So you've seen many crises and it's a, it's a great, yeah. great story about how you guys thought about things. So how do you see this crisis in comparison to some of the others, you know, 90 98, you and I were both there, 2001, the dot-com bubble, 2000. How, how do you see this differently or not differently? Yeah, so I, I mean, I, I started in 1986. I was 21 years old. Uh, and I remember 1987, uh, October of 1987, being, you know, on the uh, floor and just the market dropped 508 points. I'll never forget it, 25% uh, drop. And, you know, someone was screaming out every 10 points. And, uh, and then 1990, obviously, where the – there was a savings and loan crisis and uh, a massive recession. Um, and then, you know, obviously, 01, uh, 08, the financial crisis, which was very difficult. And then this crisis. So I would say of all the crises, by far the worst. Uh, number one, it's a health crisis. Like, people are dying. People have died. Secondly, uh, it's uh, a massive economic crisis. Um, so just to put it in context, um, the – trough unemployment uh, for the country in the financial crisis was just over 10%. Obviously, we're down to 11% now, but we hit 15%. And if it hadn't been for um, massive government action, both from the Federal Reserve and from uh, the Treasury and, the, and, the, and fiscally, uh, we would have probably hit 20 or 25%. The peak decline, uh, peak to trough decline of GDP, like we're supposed to be down 6% this year as a country. Um, that well exceeds what we were down in the financial crisis. Um, so I see this crisis somewhere between, when you look at it in context, I see this crisis somewhere between the financial crisis, which was the worst previous thing that I had been involved with, and the Great Depression, um, closer to the financial crisis. And so um, when I try to put that in context more, um, it took about three years for the economy to get from to recover from to 2007 levels from where it dropped and in the great depression it took the kind of about seven years so i think i do believe that we're in a little bit of a longer economic kind of negative climate relative to 2019 than maybe the market would be predicting 
or others would be predicting. For example, the market thinks that earnings in 2021 will be above 2019. I, I think everything that I see coming out of our portfolio and everything and the companies that we're involved with and just the consumers that have been affected and the businesses that have been affected, I don't really see that aggressive uh, position that the market's taking. So I think that's a risk. But um, you know, to, to sort of answer your question directly, I think this is the worst one I've seen. And we also have like a social crisis, right? We've got um, a lot of income inequality and you know, obviously the, we have systemic racism in the country and people are getting tired of it. And you know, the, the murder of George Floyd has created you know, a lot of division amongst the people. So I think all those things make it a really difficult time period. Let, let me let me let me address that with you. The uh, we'll talk about the racial thing in a second because I'm interested in your opinion. I just want to go back to the comments you're making about the stock market. So let's say earnings are not better. The 2021 earnings are not better than 2019. Do you think the market will still be supported by liquidity, Josh, or do you think that there's a threat that the market could roll because there just seems to be this massive amount of Federal Reserve liquidity, sort of. Yeah. Uh, you know, you know infl- reflating things, if you will. What's your, your thought on that? I'm curious about your instincts there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. So, so three. So, if you think about what the Fed has done so far, they their balance sheet's got about three trillion dollars and a little more than that. And during the entire ten years around the financial crisis, that's about what the Fed's balance sheet has grown. And they haven't. They had what it grew. They have another three trillion plus they can spend. And when you aggregate all the global monetary authorities out there, they're buying more securities than every other private entity, every company, every agency is issuing. And so the markets today are being driven by technical factors. It's the old adage, don't fight the Fed. Um, And so it's created a situation where technicals are ahead of fundamentals. And, uh, And to explain a little bit more, for the benefit of giving your money to 10 years for the U.S. Treasury, you get to earn about 70 bips. But net of inflation, that's about uh, negative 1%. Right. The earnings yield on stocks is about 6 or 7%. So there's an 800 basis point spread between treasuries and stocks. And so what people do is they move into stocks, like all the government buying and the low rates so even though I think that the, our earnings are going to miss, um, and even though I think there are a lot of risks out there, whether it be you know, the U.S. election, whether it be U.S.-China relations, whether it be earnings, as I talked about, um, I still think that you may very well go, if the Fed continues to be willing and the other monetary authorities continue to be willing to buy everything that um, is being issued and more, uh, you may have this effect of the stock market remaining higher than it should be fundamentally. And I think given the amount of debt issuance by the U.S. government, we, we, it, there's almost no choice but to you know, continue to keep rates very low for a very long time. And so you're going to have these battles between technicals and fundamentals. And I, I haven't even mentioned the fact that in 48 states, we now have rising cases again. And what is that going to do to consumer confidence? So I do think that relative to the markets, the markets might ignore fundamentals for a while um, as this you know, massive technical push comes in. All right. I mean, that's I want, I want to shift over uh, to the racial issue for a second. Uh, you mentioned that there's systemic racism in our country. Some people call it institutional racism. I firmly believe that there is, and I'm a data person. I'm, I'm assuming you're a data dependent person. I can prove it to people through data, but, but and it's just, just an opinion question. Why do you think people have a hard time saying that? You believe that, I believe that, but yet you could ask a politician and depending on what side of the aisle they're on, they may say that it doesn't exist, but yet you can see it blatantly. So. So what do you think that's? Yeah, I mean, look, there's, look, it's everything from, it's, there's systemic racism in this country. It's gone on the, the, we have a great country. I love our country, but it's, this is a dark part of our history. We need to talk about it. We need to come to grips with it. Um, and, you know, I happen to be involved with sports. Um, 75% of NBA athletes are, are black. Um, you know, I, and, and, 
I've been uh, uh, awaked or woken by like some of their stories and how they're afraid uh, in many cases in their own communities, even being famous athletes. And, um, and it's everything from educational opportunities to uh, employment opportunities to uh, training to um, you know where people start in terms of economic capability and so I don't know why people don't speak out about it I don't I think it's something that we need to speak out about that we need to not only um, listen to people but we need to hear what they're saying and actually try to address it and I just feel like as a business leader and as a leader of sports teams where sports is, you know, you're a fiduciary for a city. Um, you know, you, it's not, it's time to not only speak out, but also to do stuff, right? To do real things, whether it be how you spend your money, uh, what candidates you support, um, you know, what position, how you promote people. This is going to take an aggressive, uh, we're going to have to all be very aggressive about using this moment where stuff has come to light to change things. But as far as why people don't speak out about it, I don't know. All right, but I think it's interesting, and I, I just want to restate this for everybody listening. We get a lot of viewers. Uh, you're working in sports, and so your angle and your appreciation, I think this is true for everybody. We are products of our environments. We grow up a certain way. We live a certain way. When we're exposed to different things, uh, then it would make sense that our opinions would change. Mine have changed over the years, as I'm sure yours has as well. And so I appreciate you saying those things. I want to ask you about the migration into sports, your personal life story, uh, where uh, take us back, because I think it's an interesting thing. You're going to buy the Philadelphia 76ers. You grew up in Chevy Chase, Maryland. And so for many of us, that's sort of a boyhood dream. So take yeah. us through the iteration process of uh, what you guys were thinking about and how you took that leap. Yeah, so first of all, all four of my grand, we came over, um, the, the Harrises, as, as it were, came over to the country in 1900s through Ellis Island. All four of my great grandparents ended up in Philly somehow. And uh, my, um, my grandfather was a U.S. postal worker in Philly. My mom was a teacher and went to Temple. Dad went to Penn. They moved down, and I grew up in Chevy Chase. Um, but I went back to Penn, and in 1982, that was the era of Dr. J and Moses Malone and Maurice sure. Streaks and Andrew Tony, and I you was guys, there. You guys, for the, broke, you guys broke my heart because Dr. J was playing for the Nets at Nassau College Team Alone. You guys was. broke my heart. The ABA, um, and um, you know, I watched. I was there for the ticker tape parade and the last time the Sixers, you know, won the NBA Finals in 1982, 1983, and I experienced Philly sports. And Philly cares about sports. The fans are passionate. They're tough. They hold you accountable. But I loved every minute of it. And so um, I was lucky enough to have success um, at Apollo. And, you know, I had heard that perhaps uh, Comcast, who owned the Sixers at that time, might be willing to uh, part with the Sixers. And I called them. And uh, the next thing you know, uh, I was able to, um, with a group of partners, uh, acquire the club, the Sixers, and I, and and that was my entrance into sports, and I loved every minute of it. Like what you learn about sports, and obviously, in 2013, I acquired the New Jersey Devils, uh, and then in 2015, I uh, with a group of part, same group of partners, and then Crystal Palace, we um, uh, we own with another group of partners in London, and so um, in terms of sports, I mean, what you realize is that um, no one, people care about, you're a fiduciary for a city. People care about the team. No one cares about, like, Lyondell Chemical, which was a fantastic deal that, uh, for Apollo. And no one cares about a $50 billion market cap company, but no one cares about the price of polypropylene. But everyone cares about the Sixers starting lineup on any given day. And so um, you're a fiduciary. You bring communities together. You know, there, there's a lot of media attention on it. And so you have the ability when you own sports teams to really engage with the community and to change the community to help communities. And, you know, Philly and Newark and South London are all tough places. They need help. And so, you know, that's one thing that I've really both enjoyed, but also had to learn uh, about, you know, the scrutiny that occurs, but I've enjoyed, you know, being doing that. And I've also enjoyed, 
you know, a lot of us have been high school and college athletes, but being around the best players in the world um, at what they do is, is an incredible high for me. Um, I like to, uh, and, and what I've learned about um, these gentlemen, uh, generally they, are, they have been men, is that, um, is that they're incredible individuals as well as being great athletes. And so um, it's been uh, inspirational for me to watch um, Joel Embiid and Ben Simmons and Tobias Harris all like engage uh, um, PK Subin, all engage you know, in helping these communities dur during COVID or uh, in the case of you know, the George, George Floyd murder, speak out against racism. And you know, what you realize is that these are some of the most powerful people in the world because not only do they have money, but they've got uh, massive social media platforms and they have the ability to influence people. And they've, been, they've really stepped up as individuals and, and, and inspired me. And then lastly, you know, we want to win championships. Like this is, you know, look, the cities, like you got to win and there's pressure on you. And we, you know, we, we, um, that's been a journey. There's 30 other teams, or depending on your sport, 20 other teams in the Premier League, 31 other teams, and, like, everyone's smart and everyone's well-financed. And so, uh, you know, we're, we're on a mission to win for the cities, and the city really cares whether you win or you lose. And so, like, you know, if you win, the city's happy the next day, and if you lose, they're not. And so, like, for me, that's an avenue to compete, you know, at a very high level and be part of something that's, that's bigger than myself. And so that, that's all the reasons. And by the way, the, the other good news is that, you know, what's happening in sports is that uh, content is globalizing. So um, people now, more people in some cases uh, watch the Sixers in China than do, you know, in Philly. Um, and, and so there's, an, there's a massive tailwind behind sports content that is also helping you know, you know, kind of economically. So if you if you do all the right things, um, you can also it can also be uh, a good investment. But let me let me segue a second because we're in the pandemic. It's had an impact on sports, and in some cases, it's uh, impaired some franchises. It's impaired some leagues, yeah. frankly. And yeah. so you're a contrarian investor. So is it, it what is the future of these sports trends? Are you still are you bullish on them? Do you think this is a sea yeah. change moment for them? Or what's your, what's your opinion going forward over the next three to five years as we look past the crisis? Sure. So my opinion is that like, and what I've noticed is that there's a part of my life that's missing, not having um, Me too. basketball on, not having hockey on, not having baseball on. Um, and, and so not having football on. And so I think that, People miss sports. I think that if anything, you know, either absence is making the heart grow fonder. And I think that uh, long run, the value um, and the inspiration of these, of these clubs that are the best in the world or what they do and playing in the best leagues, I think that's going to come back. I think short run, you know, it's really tough. Um, you know, the arenas are not open. Um, there's no revenues. Um, it's, it's, it's not, I mean, no one is, you know, crying for any sports owners, but like, it's a, it's a tough sort of period of time where you got to get through it. But long run, I'm very bullish on, you know, the major sports. I mean, they're all different. Um, but I'm very bullish on, you know, people's desire to watch these sports and, and be a part of it. Well, I got, I got to, I got to tell you though, you know, we love you, Josh. But we also love the Milwaukee Bucks, okay? And why do we love the Milwaukee Bucks? Because our good friend Mark from Avenue Capital is the owner of the Milwaukee Bucks. So yeah. we're rooting for your two teams to be in the championship. And then I'll, I'll flip a coin. It, it, it's sort of the reverse of the Yankees and the Phillies in 2009 being in the World Series. As a Met fan, I was ready to jump off the Brooklyn Bridge. You know, you can't root for either yeah. of those two teams as a Met fan. But uh, I hope you get there. Uh, you've got a phenomenal success story in sports, and I love the way you're managing these teams. And so we're we're really wishing you, uh, Thank uh, you. great uh, success in what you're doing. Um, I want to switch to a question about your philanthropy, and then I'm going to turn it over to John Darcy, uh, who has questions from our audience that you know questions that have percolated in uh, since we said that we were going to do this with you. 
Um, but you are, are an amazingly charitable person. And uh, Mazel Tov, I mean, God, God bless you for being that way. I just wanted you to tell us a little bit about the programs you look to give money to, why you look to give those programs money, and what's your thought process in terms of improving society uh, through that charitable giving? Yeah, so, I mean, I, I think, first of all, all of us that are have been privileged to be successful, um, you know, have not only the opportunity, but the obligation to give back and to try to make the world a better place. And so, you know, it's my privilege to be able to do it. I really enjoy doing it. And I would say that for me, um, you know, and for my family, we've started with um, sports because we felt that it's like every other thing. You start by like saying, okay, where can you move the needle the most? And so sports has an incredible power to um, lift uh, communities and engage communities, particularly kids. And so we're amongst the largest um, investors slash donor, donors in after school sports programs that have been cut by, um, cut by uh, high schools and middle schools all over the country. And it's everything from the after school Oscars to Police Athletic League to Harlem RBI to many, many platforms. And we're helping uh, over, uh, about, over about 14,000 kids in the Philly area and, uh, you, know, you know, between 50 and 100,000 kids nationwide to, to be part of sports programs. And, you know, once they come in, you know, you feed them the lettuce. You, like, make them study. You keep them safe. You try to create a situation where they have the tool. They're, they're better equipped to move forward um, through life. And so, you know, that like whether it be, um, you know, getting better grades or doing their homework or, you know, you emphasize part of that. If you want to play um, <clears throat> in the Sixers Youth League, you got to um, you got to also study and get, you know, good grades and eat well and teach them about that. So that's kind of one major part of, of our philanthropy. I think secondly um, is. Um, is is wellness and health and you know getting people to inspiring people to um eat better um and to uh, avoid you know kind of doing things to exercise to um to not smoke to not take drugs to not drink to like try to um uh, you know inspire them to take care of themselves individually and to stay away from as much as possible the hospital system and so uh, we've developed uh, programs at Mount Sinai and, you know, all over uh, in other areas and all over the country to kind of engage with people on this level. And then um, more recently, you know, during COVID, um, we just kind of went, you know, it's all about, you know, helping the communities of Camden, Newark, Philly, and, uh, and New York, the communities and where we have real um, leverage to you know to everything from the hospital systems there to um, masks to um, you know laptops um, we bought 10,000 laptops and gave them to kids in Philly so they could go to school I, I'm, I'm I have five kids I felt like I was running a school here and I would and I couldn't imagine doing it without laptops and then we heard that you know kids in Philly needed laptops and then and then we bought you know hundreds of thousands of meals and just made sure that people were healthy in Newark, in Camden, in Philly. And so, um, you know, all of that is, you know, is kind of stuff that we've been working on. Awesome. Uh, you know, and I love the mindset application about what you're doing. I'm going to turn it over to John. He's got a plethora of questions for you. And, uh, uh, and by the way, you're winning the room Raider right now. I've got this weird wallpaper behind me. I have no idea what it is. Darcy's in sort of like a wasp closet with uh, all kinds nice. of stuff there. You've actually got pictures of the kids and a Bloomberg terminal. Yeah. So you, you <laughs> all right, you, well, you won the salt. You, I didn't even right? know. I didn't even know that. Yeah, I, was so I, mean, I just want to make sure so. you know, I am the judge. I'm, all, I'm there's only one judge and it's me. You have won the salt Excellent. talk as a result of the room rating. But go ahead, Darcy. Well, that, that, that's a good start. <laughs> All right. We, we got several questions from our, our audience leading into the talk, and I'll go into a couple of them uh, before we wrap up. So are there any specific deals that you worked on either at Apollo or, or prior to Apollo that you're particularly fond of and that demonstrate the way you think about things from an investment perspective? 
Yeah, so the one I would talk about would be Lionel Chemical. Obviously, it was one of, it's the most profitable deal ever for Apollo and one of the most profitable in private equity history. But what was really good about it was that it was a fantastic, it was a massive chemical company that got, uh, that had too much leverage going into the financial crisis. And it was um, in danger of, it had, you know, close to 50,000 employees and it was in danger of really just going away, liquidating, because it was over levered. And we were able to go in during the financial crisis and, you know, buy the debt. And we, our first buy was at 80. And, um, you know, our last, our, our, our trough buy was at 15 cents to tell you. And, you know, at that point, chemical companies were doing very poorly. They were losing money. And we had developed um, an industry a group in chemicals where we had owned a lot of companies and we really believed we were watching the turn in the economy and really believed that, um, that, that supply chain, we, we didn't believe that the demand that we were seeing was sustainable based on consumer spending. And so we were taking the other side of people who were panicking and were selling at any price. And, and then, so we acquired uh, about 30% of the debt and then we ultimately navigated a very complicated international bankruptcy with you know many many countries and many many uh uh entities and we were able to restructure the company very quickly and you know, deleverage the structure and take about 25 billion dollars of debt down to less than eight billion dollars of debt and and then um the company reemerged as we were also the, the management team in the middle of all this kind of decided they didn't want to do this anymore. And we, we had to recruit a whole management team. And, you know, the company, which had done, went from 4 billion of EBITDA to negative 1 billion of EBITDA, you know, emerged and, you know, kind of ultimately was doing 5 or 6 billion. Uh, you know, by the time that we uh, decided that it was time for us to sell out. So, and it's become this enormously successful public company that today is really thriving and prospering. And so you know, it's, a, it's an example of where um, we used, you know, our creativity and our skill sets to really help uh, a great uh, international but American company survive a very difficult time period. And we were still able to make, uh, a, create a, an attractive risk return opportunity for our investors. And you know, our investors obviously are the pension systems. They're teachers, they're firefighters, they're policemen. Uh, they're public employees all over the country and all over the world. So that would be the deal that I would talk about. Great. Doesn't exactly fit some of the negative stereotypes that you see out there about the private equity industry and, uh, and how you know, it doesn't add value. There are a lot of those. And, and there are 8 million. Um, you know, I, I, I try to educate people that right now there are 8 million um, U.S. workers that work for private equity companies. Um, there are 25 million workers that, that supply or customers of private equity companies. Private equity is the U.S. There's 35,000 private companies. There's only 4,400 public companies. Um, private companies, I mean, I, I run a public company. If I was a public company, we got to worry about quarterly earnings. And sometimes you can't always invest for the long term and do the right things. And so, um, you know, we need to do a better job. And obviously... It's a very populous environment and you know we're an easy target and we're out, you know but we need to do a better job of telling all the great things that we do and you know this is definitely one of those stories all right well that's part of why we do these salt talks so, so thanks for joining us and helping to dispel some of that that nonsense so as you look out at the landscape right now anthony touched on earlier how you're a very contrarian opportunistic type of investor as you look out over the private market landscape let's focus on fo focus on private companies as you you know, mainly do, what are the sectors that you see the most short-term impairment, but the most long-term, you know, secular bullish opportunities? Where are you really licking your chops right now as you look across private markets? Yeah, so I think private markets are, you know, look, the, the Fed action, right, has compressed or is going to compress return going forward, but like clearly as you move further outside the public markets, you're going to see better risk return opportunities. And that's what our platform is built to do. And I would say that, you know, the impacted sectors <clears throat> that we're seeing uh, opportunity in, you know, are, are you know, are, are generally going to be the sectors that have been hardest hit by COVID. Uh, and, and so in many cases, these are like travel related sectors, 
um, their, um, you know, hotels, um, I think their uh, real estate, certain types of real estate, um, I'd say um, certainly um, uh, venues and arenas and, um, you know, the entertainment based companies. And so the truth of the matter is we're in the early part of the crisis, we were able to invest in these companies. Um, and this is primarily private equity. I'll take a walk through. We're mostly now, we're 400 billion of AUM. Uh, pro forma for a deal that we just did called Jackson. Uh, of that, we're about 80 plus percent credit uh, lending to companies and great American businesses. Uh, and, we're, and we're only less than 20% what I call opportunistic private equity, but that's still what we're known for. So in the opportunistic sectors, uh, it's going to be those sectors that have been really hard hit and where um, you know, the valuations reflect to a large extent some of the concern so that, that would be, on in the, and in private equity day, we're mostly buying debt. So we're just starting to look at deals now. Um, in, in, the, in mezzanine, which is taking a walk towards some of the safer stuff, so the middle part of the capital structure, um, we continue to do very large investments, many of which are public, uh, everything from Expedia to uh, Simpress to Albertson. So many, many deals where companies are looking for a little bit of capital either to grow or get over the hump in a short-term capital crunch situation because their revenues have been impacted, but they long run see a lot of value. And so in these, all these investments, we're able to make investments that build in our view of the world, which is it's going to be a three or five year type time frame before they return back to you know, where they were in 19. And, and so it gives us, you're really making a bet on terminal value. You have a lot of room and you're really able to bid in quite a bit of losses in the short run, but you're looking at long run, you know, asset value creation. Uh, in, in the rest of our portfolio, um, a lot of what the Fed has done has been um, triple A or government securities. They, they have bought some high yield. Uh, but these are the big liquid, and they, these are the big liquid issuances. Um, much of the small business lending or other programs that they're trying to do, they're not reaching many of the structured credit vehicles that we, or the middle market businesses that we actually invest in. And so in the middle market, um, you can continue to get um, very attractive returns lending to businesses that have 20, 25, 50 million of EBITDA. The bank market, notwithstanding the Fed action, is still pretty shut down. The high yield market is open. So anything with a QCIP, anything that's publicly traded is open, but the bank markets um, are generally pretty closed right now, and so are the structured credit markets. So that impacts everything from real estate financing to uh, restaurants, to um, people like aircraft leasing has been very impacted. Uh, we have a group that does sale leasebacks around malls and hotels. So all of those structures, right, are away from the Fed money and we're just providing liquidity to uh, every, everyone from restaurants to small businesses to hotel owners, allowing them to weather the crisis and getting paid you know, probably arbitrages of one to 400 basis points, depending on where they are in the, in the credit stack. So last question before we let you go, you know, you, you've helped build Apollo into one of the world's largest and, and best performing investment firms. You mentioned about 400 billion in pro forma assets under management. Looking at uh, both the way you've built Apollo and the way you're running the sports franchises that you own, and you can talk about it through the lens of sports ownership, you know, with the Philadelphia 76ers, you've, you've taken, you know, not that you're the general manager, but you guys have taken players like Joel Embiid that you drafted and developed into one of the best players in the league. You have Ben Simmons, who's a six foot nine player playing the point guard position. You have Tobias Harris, who's a six foot 10 shooting guard. When you look at building teams and building organizations, you know, how do you align the way you think about business at somewhere like Apollo when you're looking at investments and how you look at something like running a sports franchise, and, and how do you go about building those dynastic franchises the way someone like the New England Patriots or the San Antonio Spurs have done over the last 10, 15 years? Yeah, so I think it starts with people. You gotta have, if you get the best and the brightest people and you build, and, you, and you're able to uh, not only recruit them, but also um, 
provide resource them and provide them a vision for where you want to go. So if you get the best people, and I think this is all just basic fundamentals, you know, building, being successful on the court, you know, attracting the right players, it's that you got to be successful off the court first. And, 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 and so, and then it's about um, having a unique strategy or some unique thought as to how you're going to do things a little differently. So in the case of, uh, sports, right? We're, we're developing a lot of advanced data. You know, you, there are 30 smart owners. How do you get an edge? Uh, how do you select those players? How do you recruit those players? In basketball, it's about, you know, tr you know making sure they want to play with you uh, because ultimately they have a lot of choices. But then beyond that, um, having uh, the right sports science, the right uh, programs for them, to keep them healthy, to extend their careers, uh, analytics so that you can um, – Run, you know, you can select them. I mean, everyone wants these players, um, and 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 it's no different out of Paul. Like, it, you know, we had a unique. It, it's about innovating. So it's about innovating. It's about having the right people, and then it's about having a culture where they stay and they're excited to work with you. Well, that's all we have for you today, Josh. Thanks again so much for joining us uh, in the middle of the summer, Anthony. I don't know if you have any final words. I have one final request for Josh, and I'm sure he'll appreciate this. If anything should happen to you in the sports world, can you give me a call, please? I want to be one of the first. You got people. it, man. All right? I, I got need it. From you. I, hear you're, uh, I, th I hear you have a lot of thoughts on this. <laughs> All right. Well, we wish you the best, man. God bless. It's great to have you on Salt. And uh, hopefully, Josh, we can get you to one of our live events uh, as soon can, as we can, can get wait. out of the COVID-19 situation. Can't wait, and I and I like and I like the wall behind you. Don't sell yourself short. I might have to. I'm, I'm, I think you might have won. I'm trying to figure out if it's an insect or not. It's it's a, <laughs> it's a it's a rough room raider for me, Josh. If I do television, let's just put it that way. I may have to come over to your house and use that background. All right, you got it. Anytime. All right, be well, man. Thank you for everything. Pleasure. Thank you.